yeah, so um, here we are. <laughs> We're going to make... Can we just say that Janderson Gaming was the stupidest title ever for a YouTube channel? I had no other ideas when I was in high school, so I just went with it. Um, yeah, but I've been uh, so bored that I thought this would be a good idea. Uh, and no more fake Janderson Buck Bumble videos. <laughs> we're going to actually make a real one. Real one. So today we're going to be talking about... Star Fox 64. It's a classic. It's a great game. It even has my little name on it that someone else wrote because my handwriting is freaking Egyptian hieroglyphs. Star Fox 64 is a masterpiece. It's one of the few N64 games that has aged super, super well. Uh, I think other games from the console hold up still. Um, they're good, but in a way that you can still tell that they're, you know, from the N64 and it's dated. This game doesn't feel dated at all, I think. It's one of the best N64 games. I think it's one of the best games, but I'm a little biased just because I'm so nostalgic for it. Uh, so today, that's what we're going to be doing. It's going to be the Janderson Gaming. Let's see if I can edit text there. Janderson Gaming Star Fox 64 review. I hope you guys enjoy. It'll be a little less cringy than my other videos um, because it won't. It will be more like a video essay. We'll see. So without further ado, Janderson Gaming Star Fox 64. Star Fox was released in 1993 for the Super Nintendo. At the time, it was revered as a technical masterpiece as it was showcasing the brand new Super Nintendo FX chip. This chip helped create more detailed polygon models to allow for 3D gameplay. But if you look back at it now, the game doesn't quite hold up graphically. Inconsistent frame rate, unclear graphical representation of enemies, the list goes on. This game was a crazy smash hit for Nintendo as it sold over 4 million units in its lifetime. To put that in perspective, Buck Bumble's numbers aren't even available, and we know what a smash hit Buck Bumble was. Bump to the boom to the boom to the base to the bump to the bump to the help me. People just couldn't get enough of being an anthropomorphic fox flying around in a plane, so calls were made to make a sequel. Nintendo soon began working on a follow-up game, Star Fox 2, but they went in a different direction. Star Fox 2 was actually a real-time battle simulator. The player would choose between different characters and move around the galaxy, conquering planets and defeating enemies. Andross would also randomly send bosses to fight you while in deep space, causing you to change directions as you're still trying to protect the home world of Corneria. Oddly enough, the game was fully finished but never released to the public. Nintendo was afraid that the current 16-bit graphics would look inferior to the other 32-bit systems at the time, but, you know, we all know how well those did. It was finally released, though, in 2017 on the SNES Classic. Now that we have all the history out of the way... Star Fox 64 was released in 1997 on the N64. 1997 was a great year as it gave us other fantastic innovations, like Teletubbies and the death of Princess Diana. Alright, maybe that's a bad idea. Star Fox 64 is a classic in every sense of the word. Everything about it is great. Controls, music, theming, story, all of it. The reason I came out of retirement is I want to put on my video analyzing hat and describe why I believe Star Fox 64 is not only great, but a subtle masterpiece. The first level is Corneria, your ally's home planet. General Pepper is asking for the Star Fox team to help, and you have finally arrived. From the first moment of the game, you are in control of your R-Wing. Controls are simple enough. A to shoot lasers, B to shoot bombs, control stick to move your ship and your reticle. Before any obstacles are thrown at you, the game gives you time to get used to the controls by throwing in a few easy enemies over water. Now water is the only surface in the game that if you hit, you won't take any damage. This gets you used to moving and shooting, as most rail shooters don't involve dodging obstacles. This game design allows you to get used to the controls quickly. As the first level progresses, you are treated to a variety of new techniques that you didn't learn before, such as boosting to chase enemies and rolling to block lasers. Insert joke from 11. These mechanics build upon each other as they come incrementally. You never feel overwhelmed by new mechanics as they are integrated into gameplay perfectly, such as boosting to go save Falco. Finally, you come across a boss and you go into all range mode. This turns the gameplay from a rail shooter to a dogfight simulator. 
It's actually a pretty good change of pace as it allows you to actually feel like you're in control of a fighter plane instead of just playing the Buzz Lightyear ride at Disneyland. If we ever get to do that again. Once the boss is defeated, you talk with your squad and you head out. By the end of the first level, you should have moving and shooting under your belt. The first level is a good introduction to things that are to come, which brings me to my next point. I'm a big fan of games that are linear. Most people like open world games with tons to do, but I always feel like a tightly made challenge is better than hours of boring side quests. This is why I really love games like Cuphead and Castlevania. Linear games allow game designers to make each level special, as you do not need to add hours of filler content. Star Fox is not a long game, but because it's short, it allows the game designers to maximize the potential of each planet. Each level has its own unique atmosphere, from creepy... Somebody beat it here! It's all gone! ...to intriguing... I'm sending the data to you guys! Shoot a torpedo to help you see! Exciting... Enemy approaching from the left! We'll gladly take this one. It's got anything you could ever want. The Blue Marine and Landmaster levels are awesome, adding even more variety. The level where you chase a train as the Landmaster is excellent and by far my favorite level in the game. I could keep gushing about it for hours, but at this point most people are right about to click off the video, so I'm gonna keep moving. Each level ends with a boss fight, which are all super solid. Some people don't like boss fights as they think they're dated. Bosses act as a great final challenge as well as the final use of a level's art design centered around one figure. Each boss looks and sounds amazing. All have unique attacks and abilities, they're all brimming with personality. <laughs> I'm no match for you. I admit defeat. Are you gonna listen to that monkey? <laughs> You're not as stupid as you look! Some take you from a linear level to all range mode. Some levels have different bosses depending on the route you're taking. Speaking of root... There are two different paths to take on the lilac map. The right path, or easy path, and the left path, or hard path. Each route is filled with different levels and challenges. Depending on which side you enter the final level from will change the final boss and the ending of the game. To get on the hard path, specific challenges need to be met to properly advance. In the first level, after saving Falco, you need to fly under all these arches. This will make Falco impressed with you and cause him to take you to the real boss of the stage, which is actually a callback. <sighs> which is actually a callback to the first Star Fox on the Super Nintendo. After defeating him, you are then placed on the hard path. This level design choice makes Star Fox 64 very replayable. Even though this game only takes a little over an hour to complete, it makes every playthrough unique and challenging. This game rewards you for being skilled by giving you harder challenges, while at the same time keeping less skilled players from being overwhelmed by giving them easier tasks. It allows for a beginner to climb the ranks and become better. Most difficult games are just hard and you need to catch up to be successful. Star Fox has a graded difficulty scale without you realizing it. This is in sharp contrast to Nintendo's current game development philosophy, which seems to reward you for playing poorly. In Super Mario 3D World, if you die enough times, you are given the Golden Tanuki Suit, which basically just makes you invincible. What's fun about games is completing difficult challenges, not having your hand held through a virtual walk. Star Fox allows players who are new to get better, and it rewards them for getting better by unlocking new levels and new challenges. It doesn't keep the player stagnant. Let me give you an example. Suppose it's your first time playing through the game, so you don't know any of these secrets or that there's even a lilac path. So you probably won't be able to save Falco your first time through that first level, or even if you did, you probably won't fly under all the arches. So when it gets to this first boss, you'll still be learning all range mode. Which, you know, that's kind of different to the normal gameplay and moving around and controlling the camera, so it requires some practice. 
But the first boss, they designed him to be purposely pretty easy so that you can understand all range mode. So once you beat him, you move on to the asteroid belt. Similar to the first level, you get better with the techniques that you've been taught before, like breaking and boosting, maybe even somersaulting. Once that level is complete, you head to Hoth. Now Hoth is the first level to take place entirely in all range mode. It's also the first level with Star Wolf. More on him later. The first time fighting him, you probably still don't have all range mode down pat, so you're still struggling with somersaulting and all these techniques, so you probably won't defeat him your first time through. Now a normal game would have you game over and restart the level. But what this game does is it keeps going. You move on to the next level, but it's on the easy path. So say, next time you pick up Star Fox, you come back to this point and you've gotten better. You're able to beat Star Wolf. Well, now you're rewarded with an entirely new next level. So it keeps you invested in playing and trying to get all the different paths and levels. Last thing I'll say about levels is they all have tons of secrets and there's these warp zone areas which are super cool, which are ways to get back onto the hard path if you make a mistake. They look cool, they sound great, but I've already talked about levels for 10 minutes so I think we'll move on. Writing in video games is a topic that I'm really interested in. You have some games that have no story that are masterpieces, and other games with only story and they're also masterpieces. Personally, I like games with good atmosphere and theming. Bioshock, the Metal Gear franchise, Wind Waker. There is a varying amount of storytelling between these games, but they all have good world building and personality. I'm not going to act like Star Fox is on par with Mass Effect, but it gives the player enough to keep them engaged and hit some points that make it stand out. The story is basic but serviceable, and the personality of the characters shines through. Corneria, fourth planet of the Lilat system. The evil Andros turned... Star Fox starts off with an exposition dump. I personally don't find that as an issue, but that's also because I'm biased and I think this game can do no wrong. This is the only exposition that we get in the game. I find the lore interesting as it establishes a threat and a personal vendetta for our main character of Fox, as Andros not only threatens the galaxy, but he also killed your dad. If you skip through this, you could probably pick up most of it throughout the game through subtle little dialogue like Peppy saying, You're becoming more like your father. Follow your father's example, Fox. Your father helped me like that too. Okay, not that subtle. But writing is only as good as the characters that live in it. The characters of Star Fox are actually pretty good. The way Fox interacts with this squad is just so fun and natural, there is a lot of chemistry between the characters. Each member of the squad has their own personality traits that come out organically. Peppy is an old pro who still looks up to Fox's father James. Slippy is a gearhead with less experience in the cockpit than the garage. Falco is your friendly rival who tries not to show that he cares about you. Gee, I've been saved by Fox, how swell. The banter between them all is great, and the voice acting is actually really good considering the time. Sure, sometimes you hear a line more than once. And the dialogue can be a little cheesy. Hey Einstein, I'm on your side! But the personality shines through. I love the way they roast Slippy after the Blue Marine level. You can just tell that they all really like each other, and the camaraderie feels really genuine. Thanks, Slip. Blue Marine came through. Slip is not such a screw up after all. Thanks a lot, Peppy. I'll take the sky any day. Cease, Falco. You too. This isn't just true for the heroes. The villains are all super unique and charismatic. There are too many to go into right now, but I do want to talk about Star Wolf. The evil version of Star Fox, Star Wolf is also a squad of four, with their leader being Wolf... O'Donnell? I guess he's Irish. Odd. Okay, that's a stupid, stupid joke. Cut that. Please clap. Ligma, who used to be a part of Star Fox, betrayed the team, which led to James McCloud's death. Pigma always makes sure to bring that up to Fox and the gang when they're fighting. It's honestly incredibly brutal in the ways in which Pigma talks about Star Fox's dad. Daddy screamed real good before he died. Too bad dad's not here to see you fail. I have no idea how Nintendo put that into a kid's game. Leon's like, you know, 
a pompous lizard, and Andrew's just this big simp for Andros. Starwolf does serve as this perfect mirror image of Fox and the gang, and I know that the evil team trope has been done to death, but I'm always a fan of a good versus evil story. For its era, Star Fox has some excellent world building. Like I said before, the only exposition dump comes from the opening. Everything else is subtly introduced to the player. Take Bill for example. Listen to the opening line between Bill and Fox. Fox, you made it! Bill! Is that you? I can't believe it! We can catch up later, Fox. And just from that, we know that these two have a friendly history, we know that they've worked together, and we know they've probably fought together. But the game doesn't waste time giving us a long overdone backstory. It keeps things simple. The same is true for Cat. We know that there is some romantic history between Falco and Cat, but we don't need to know specifics. So we're not given them. Otherwise, it would be detrimental to the pace of the game. Keep in mind, this game is meant to take place in a war. People in a war don't just see friends that they've known in the past and just start spilling their beans and life story to them. They're trying to survive. A little Ali Stewart ass? Where he got his name from? You could say your wartime buddy, Ali. The one who made it through the whole war without taking a single hit. And managed to do it with a smile. But then you look at him square in the face. And you smile like I do. Like this. Holly! 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 No! When it comes to finally facing off against Andros, the result is really satisfying, as he's been built up throughout the entire game. You'll never defeat Andros! Ah, the sun to fly. He is an established threat that the main character has an established vendetta against. There is a really cool undertone throughout this game that Fox is never going to be as good as his dad. He is constantly compared to him, and his father's death is always thrown in his face, sometimes in the most brutal ways. Daddy screamed real good before he died. This concept comes to a head when you finally face off against Andros, as not even Fox's father was able to defeat him. I think that's the reason Fox chooses to go after Andros alone. I could be reading too much into this, but it seems like Fox feels like he has something to prove. This makes finally destroying Andros all the sweeter. The first time I played through Ocarina of Time, I really didn't think the game was all that special. I thought it hadn't aged too well, and the gameplay wasn't the best, and just overall wasn't the greatest experience. My opinion changed as I watched the end credits scroll, and I saw all the memorable characters I'd met along my adventure, and it felt like I had actually earned the completion of my quest. All of the problems I had with the game just felt so minor when I saw it all together like that. I think the same is true for Star Fox. Now, I might enjoy Star Fox more start to finish, but it still leaves that lasting impact on me every time I finish the game. When your ghost dad leads you out of that tunnel and you go back to Corneria, it's a cool feeling. I do have some personal attachment to this game as it was the first game I ever owned, so when I finally beat it, it kind of felt like a coming of age moment for me. I'm sure most of you that play this game probably won't experience the same thing, but to me this game will always be special. This game is a triumph, and one of the best games that Nintendo has ever made. It's great for new players, and super replayable for the most seasoned vets. Tons of challenges like expert mode, which still give me trouble. To me, this game is the perfect example of less equals more. As good as this game is, there are some problems that I have with it. I think the graphics are really good for the time, and, and still hold up pretty well, but the black backgrounds can make certain enemies really hard to see specifically in this one boss fight. The frame rate also has a tendency to drop when there's an explosion on screen, so this happens a lot in the blue marine level. Lastly, some of the tells as to where bosses are going to be attacking are kind of unclear, so I can see how new players would take some undeserved hits, because they didn't know where the shots were going. I've never played the 3DS version of this game, so I don't know, maybe it fixes all the problems, huh? 
It's sad that Nintendo has literally no idea how to handle this franchise after this game. They tried that Zelda clone that no one really liked, they tried Star Fox Assault, which was okay, but it had a lot of problems. I hope that one day they bring this franchise home and, and get what people liked about it to begin with correct, but I don't see that happening. But hey, even if this game is lightning in a bottle, it's still great. It's a game that you can keep playing and, and keep finding more to like about it. There is always another challenge to take, one more boss to fight, one more laser to dodge.